Yeah. You know, what strikes me out of all of your presentations is, is that the IPCC reports have been about as accurate and as uh, reliable as the CBO reports in the federal budget. Uh, so, I, I think you're... <laughs> yeah. And you need to hold it up, kind of... Sorry. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I think you're doing the IPCC a, great, uh, a grave injustice. <laughs> they are doing exactly what they were mandated to do. They're a mar marketing organization that are there to market the uh, UN climate policies and the various governments' climate policies, yeah. and they're doing a brilliant job. I don't know how we account for that. So uh, as a marketing organization, they are, they're outstanding. Oh, yes, but they're not a science organization at all. No, no, no they're not interested in the you've, science. You've just neutralized all of my questions. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, so I want to ask you, Dr. Spencer, uh, how well do today's climate models really incorporate new discovery. I mean, that's one of, the, one of the most important things about modeling is that as discovery occurs, as trend lines change, the models are able to uh, incorporate that and, and, and not just stutter out. Uh, how well is new knowledge incorporated in these models? Well, I suppose the modelers would say that they're incorporating new knowledge all the time, but it's not the kind of knowledge we need to move the science forward uh, because there's i don't know whether it got mentioned yet but <clears throat> the climate modeling uh, enterprise has been around since the uh, late 1980s basically and in 1979 uh, there was a ch was that the charney report 1979 right, yeah. NAS, national that academy of science came up with uh, an estimate of of how m how much warming there should be from a doubling of atmospheric co2 and I think, you know, it was a, like a range of a factor of three, and that hasn't changed in all of the IPCC reports. You know, we're now up to the sixth assessment report. They're working on the seventh. And the latest one, the, the climate model intercomparison part of it, there's more disagreement between the coldest models and the warmest, well, I should say the warmest models and the least warm models. Uh, there's more disagreement than there ever has been. Um, so obviously they're doing something wrong. Uh, and it seems like they don't spend enough time trying to figure out what that is. And I think, you know, they, they think it's related to clouds, how clouds behave over the Western Pacific or something like that. I think there's more fundamental questions uh, that, that they don't get right, like things related to precipitation efficiency and things where they just assume something and stick it in the model. In one line of code, well, since we really don't understand this, we're going to put this one line of code in there to handle that. And these models have at least a million lines of code. Um, so I, I think they're looking in the wrong place to improve the models. Yeah, I've, I, I've, I've heard about that phenomenon of hard, hard wiring or hard coding uh, answers that you just can't figure out that the model won't solve. Dr. Soon, do you have any comments on that? My, my comment is that... <clears throat> climate model, I guess in the sense of numerical weather prediction, <clears throat> they're sort of useful in the sense that they treat the problem as what you call, given this time, I want to see the next second, the next second, the next second, right? So initial value problem. <coughs> For the question of climate, it's becoming extremely complex and difficult. You have to worry about the biology. You have to worry about the ocean. You have to worry about volcano, you have to worry about the sun, you have to worry about so many other things. In fact, you may have not heard the subtle hint that Roy says actually in his talk. The model doesn't conserve energy properly. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It doesn't conserve even, let's say, stuff like water, for example. That's why a model could never be used for forecasting or predicting a, a sea level change. It's ridiculous. It's completely wrong, actually. Don't conserve mass. So what does that mean? The, uh, it's such a misuse of a, of a tool that is re reasonable for numerical weather prediction. But for the question of even addressing rising carbon dioxide, what happened? Inadequate. Just cannot do it. And let alone they running all these scenarios, this, this crazy scenario about future. It's always about, don't worry about validating the model. But always look into the future. I mean, that's, that's becoming a really dangerous game. Doubling atmospheric CO2 might sound like really dramatic. And we might reach doubling late in the century. Kind of depends on future economic activity and all of that. But it's still only like a 1% change in the energy balance of the Earth. 
you know, you've got everything else going on, like Willie's talking about, you know, that, that we really don't have a good handle on. And all the IPCC is worried about is this 1% change. That's all it is, is about 1%. Another thing I want to say is I want to defend the very sad volcanology uh, <laughs> science. The IPCC approach of climate modeling essentially destroy the volcanology study for a thousand years, I would say. Because they treat every volcano as sulfate aerosols and then just radiative forcing this, radiative forcing that. These are all the terms that they use. Sounded very sciencey, but it means nothing. A whole bunch of crap. It's really bad stuff. Volcanologists, because of funding issue, that's why I emphasize funding, sit quietly, like passively. Tell me which two volcanoes are the same. Give me, give me some ideas. These people are really pulling the science to the really dead end. I mean, and, and it's very sad, actually. For the solar one, it's even more irritating, obviously. We've yeah. been putting up satellite for almost 40 years. 40 years. Each of the satellites showing different, actually, absolute value of the sun irradiance, the light output. No one knows how to put them together. December of 2024, our team, led by Ronan Connolly, published a paper showing you how you should do that before you even go any further or fund another 100 or $200 million project to go and do this sort of nonsense again. And then no one knows how to put them all together. Do you understand what I mean? This is the problem of... Uh, Model calibration, even the absolute models, the climate model need these numbers to be correct. Yeah. You know, like how the sun, how much energy we input to the sun, we don't know up to 10, 20 watts per meter square. Th these right? are, CO2 doubling is 4 watts per meter square. These, these are big holes in the model. Big There's holes, no, very no, big no, holes. No question. Uh, Dr. Connolly, before we go to the microphone in the back, uh, I'm just stunned by the fact that you're talking about measurements that have not been adequately done, not been adequately reviewed, not been adequately categorized, and, you know, sort of like hundreds of years, <laughs> a long time we've had some measurements and you're just discovering point after point to point where it's been not been done correctly. I mean, how are these measurement models actually reviewed? They're not. Uh, and and I, I, uh, when I started studying the balloon data, I used the uh, NOAA uh, archive and what I discovered there was that all of the balloon data for America and North America, uh, 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 South and North America, uh, is not in synchronized with the actual uh, local measurements. So every year from all around the world, about f uh, from 800 different stations, the uh, balloons are sent up into the atmosphere uh, twice a day. Uh, sometimes four times a day, but uh, they are all set up at the exact same time. It's uh, Greenwich Mean Time, if you're English, at uh, that time of the, uh, the day everywhere. Uh, and when I started looking at the data, I noticed that the ones that were, were being sent up at night in North America were actually, the ground level values were the hottest. But when I looked at the ground station temperatures, they were actually the coldest. So all of that data is stored 12 degrees out of phase, or 12 hours out of phase. I don't know whether it's before or behind, but, but that's still the case. So yes. I know I'm the only one that has actually looked at that in detail because I've pointed it out several times, but still. That's just, uh, that's just stunning. That in, really is. In, just in stunning. any case, I want to say that please come to series.sign.com where we have a lot of this because this is short forum that we don't have enough time to explain all the things. But it's truly fascinating and beautiful science in that sense that we really found some kind of new principle yes. of how atmosphere should behave. And it's all uh, because uh, of Michael and, Connolly. And it's, it's all just experimental results, not models. No, uh, uh, as a scientist and an engineer, because I'm both. Uh, I use uh, equations and models to come up with new designs for things uh, and make new products. Uh, but as a scientist, I evaluate those models using the data. And that's what should have been done by all these models, and it hasn't been done. No. And this is the first time. It is amazing that we're the only ones that looked at uh, whether the atmosphere from ground to level was in thermodynamic equilibrium or not. That, that's just, the only that's, that's just was, amazing to me. And, and looking yeah. and saying, why not use molar density as a way? Yeah. Uh, and why not look 
at the mass fluxes to the sea, do these solar cells occur? Nobody else has done that. Why? Oh, that's amazing. Right. They want uh, to chop the, the, the atmosphere into one kilometer, one kilometer, right? But we see that the whole thing is doing up and down, up and down, like this. And then, of course, opposite relation between the stratosphere and the stroposphere. We, it's fascinating stuff. We have a question in the back of the room. Yes. Okay. All right, well, <clears throat> firstly, I want to thank the three of you for a very enlightening uh, talk, or a set of talks, I should say. We're going to extend the Q&A for another 10 minutes because there is you know, such interesting conversation going on. Um, I have two questions, actually, one for Dr. Spencer and one for Dr. Soon. And Dr. Connell, you're welcome to chime in on these. Yeah. Uh, you know, Dr. Spencer, you mentioned that you know you, we saw this you know the significant disparity between climate models and the actual observations. In your chart, a few models actually seem to get the temperatures right. Um, with past CMIP modeling, it was the Russian models. I'm wondering if you had any comments on the models in your chart today that actually got it right and why, unless it was due to random chance. Uh, well, we know from the um, the Russian models that that they have. You know, if you go beyond 2022, 2023, 2024, uh, you know, you go out another 50 or 100 years, they do produce less the less warming. I don't think it's well understood what the differences are between the models in terms of feedbacks. It's it's usually related to clouds, mm. uh, how they handle clouds, which is you know everyone, even the modelers, agree is a huge um, uncertainty. Uh, now the a related follow-up question that I thought maybe you were going to ask is, why don't we just use the models that are closest to the observations for forming policy? That wasn't my question, but go ahead, please. That's a, that's a, that's a stunning statement. Can I add a statement. note on this? Because I, I literally been to the center where they produce this model. It's drawn by a guy named Igor Mokov. It's at the uh, Obu, Monin Obukov uh, Institute of Atmospheric Physics. I am sorry, there's nothing special in the model. I have to say that, please, if the model agree with the observation, I would say that you run as fast as you can. You know why? You know not 99.9%. .9%. You know 100% that they got it right for the wrong reason. This is be careful. Do not be fancy into their model. It's so bad that, please, there's no chance. OK? No chance. I want to pursue this. I want to pursue this because it's a really important question. Sorry. It just really <laughs> bothers me. Why don't we have? a closer connection between the modeling work we're doing and the observed data. I mean, in economics, if we let the models go off from whatever direction they wanted to go off in, we'd be out of business instantly. We have, we're constantly uh, pulling things back to current observations. I, I'm just stunned by this. I, 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 I once uh, gave a talk at a conference of economists, and I was struck by how well everyone got along with each other. Because, you know, when we go to a conference, you know, people with different theories are all antagonistic, <laughs> you know, and all of that. And I said, how come you e economists that, because they had very different ideas about how things work and they all got along just fine. And I said, why, why do they get along so well? He said, because we know enough about uh, economics that all of us have been wrong, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I often say that economics is harder than nuclear physics, but uh, maybe it's harder than climate science. I, I, Dr. Dr. Connolly, you want to come in? Uh, I forget why. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I had one more question. Go ahead, uh, Kevin. So, um, and this is for all three of you, particularly uh, Dr. Soon, but you know, you mentioned that the urban heat island effect contaminates temperature records. I think, you know, especially since there are people here who are involved in government, I think the, the pushback or the criticism you would get is, yes, these cities are warmer and people are suffering more. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah, this is real phenomenon. It is climate change, right? But it's not caused by carbon dioxide for sure, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, 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 we have to deal with this. Yes, indeed. So yeah, the indeed. urban heat island effect would, you know, would, be, would cause warming even if there was no global warming. Right. right? They're two different issues. Yeah, right? Two different, different issues. And what's interesting is when you hear about new records were set, it's usually urban areas where the new records are being set. Yeah. They, are, they don't talk about you know, urban or, uh, rural areas setting new uh, uh, high temperature said, If you prescribe the policy of cutting carbon dioxide, what do you get? Tell me. Uh, what do we get? It won't affect the urban heat island at all. That's the problem, yeah. right? So I don't and, know. It's and like the, <laughs> the urban areas uh, only account for uh, two or three percent of the world's uh, area, but 
uh, they account for over 50% of the temperature records. Okay. So, you know, it's... For a, historical reason. Yeah. I, I'd like to end this with an online question about a solar flare. We haven't had a solar flare question yet come up. Uh -huh. And so um, any, anybody can answer this, so it's directed to you, Dr. Soon, but anyone can wade in. Uh, since the power blackout that recently occurred in Portugal, Spain, and other parts of France uh, have, uh, have been declared as not a cyber attack, okay, not a, t a terrorism attack, could it be the result of an angry sun? Uh, for that particular event, no, because I no. have to remember, I'm one of the unique guys who actually basically watches the sun every day. <laughs> every day. I kind of know what it does today. Uh, a good news is that we just finished a groundbreaking paper on solar flare, which I rescued a record all the way back to 1937. So I hope Wright will approve of that because we're really always trying to rescue data. <laughs> so we produced the longest continuous solar flare data in history. So uh, you can uh, be uh, proud of us as series that sign because come yeah. to that website, we'll show you where to find the papers and read all these interesting yeah. results. The other thing about that particular event is that uh, at that particular time, most of the, uh, they had reached what they called 100% uh, renewable uh, energy. But the trouble with renewable energy, uh, and I'm speaking as an electrical engineer, is that it causes oscillations in the lines. And so, uh, the, the, in order to keep the frequency of the uh, electricity at 50 hertz, which it is there, they have to sample something that's stable. And that requires uh, uh, turbines uh, which have a, a, an inertia in them that allows you to match that. And when they've switched almost over to 100% new re uh, uh, um, uh, renewables, they had nothing to measure the frequency against. And so there is uh, these logic circuits that just shut the whole thing down. Well, um, l let me just say so something that's gratuitous, but it's heartfelt. Uh, I know it's not easy to question models in your profession. I know it's not easy to come up and be critical of the received truth. But my golly, it's so, so important. And I think we learned today that if we don't have courageous scientists like this who are out there questioning these models, we could very well fall into uh, being the slave of what Keynes said was a faceless and nameless bureaucrat who was using science to run our lives. So would you please uh, th uh, join me in thanking all these people here. Thank you very much.